Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online, my name is David Fitzgerald. I co-direct the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies. And before we get going with today's event, I just have a quick programming note, which is that on May 19th, we'll be discussing Leah Bustan's new book, Streets of Gold. Um, but today we are happy to have our last in-person event of the year, I believe. Uh, and welcome Michael Gordon, our visiting scholar. Those of you in the room, uh, those of you in the room know Michael well, uh, but he is a visiting researcher at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Canada, and is going to be speaking to us about standoff politics and carcerality at sea, criminalizing solidarity in the Central Mediterranean. So, welcome, Mike. Awesome. Thank you very much, David, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, I mean, this has been a quite an enjoyable time uh, being down here at. Uh, UC San Diego in, in the center. So I think it's the opportunity to present and talk a little bit about uh, my research today. Um, so what I'm going to do, just to kind of uh, lay out sort of broadly what the talk is going to look like, but, uh, you know, I want to um, contextualize, uh, I kind of want to contextualize and see sort of what uh, what is SAR and how is it governed or search and rescue, how is it governed? I want to look at this idea of standoff politics and 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 um, kind of interrogate what you know what are standoffs and, and bureaucratic blockades, kind of looking at the history in the Mediterranean, uh, but then also uh, exploring the different ways that the standoff manifests. And then to try and tie it all together, I'm going to situate standoffs as part of a broader criminalization of solidarity um, taking place, and and uh, with standoffs kind of representing one sort of aspect in the broader uh, assemblage of state control and, and criminalization. So before we get going, I, I want to kind of talk about or bring up uh, an anecdote for uh, to kind of shape uh, the discussion. So what we have here is um, uh, in in 2019 uh, in, in the summer there was uh, following a, um, a a rescue uh, one of the civil uh, fleet uh, search and rescue ships Sea Watch Three was engaged in several um, several rescues in the Central Mediterranean. Um, but following the rescue, they were left uh, to, to float and trace uh, the uh, territorial waters of uh, the off the coast of Lampedusa, a small Italian island uh, in the middle of the Mediterranean. But as time went on uh, and the, uh, the boat was not able to disembark those uh, on board, uh, the situation on, on, uh, on the ship uh, deteriorated to the point where a uh, state of emergency was eventually declared. Um, uh, again, we see uh, we saw no action um, taking place, and eventually the ship uh, starts moving in closer towards uh, the island itself, breaking the territory line. Um, again, they were denied entry, and uh, as a result, they uh, took direct action and, and entered the port without uh, authorization. Uh, in the process, they bumped a, 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 an Italian uh, Navy vessel, the Prime Minister at the time, uh, uh, Matteo Salvini called this a tantamount to an act of war. Um, the uh, captain, Carlo Ricchetti, who's the individual you see at the top, was, uh, was arrested in a very high profile and dramatic um, event. Uh, and she was charged um, as a result of, of uh, her work. And while the charges were eventually dismissed, this is actually served, I think, as one of the most uh, dramatic confrontations with state blockades uh, in, in the Mediterranean. So uh, just quickly before we move on, I just want to talk about the picture itself in terms of what that highlights. I think the what we see here is an image of uh, AIS or autom um, automated information software, which uh, or information system which allows uh, ships to be tracked while at sea. And so this is sort of a um, it sends a satellite signal, and you're able to basically effectively watch uh, ships move throughout the sea. Um, but I think what beyond sort of the, the obvious, uh, I think that it, it, it shows the, the lines of sovereign power uh, um, being made visible, gives us an opportunity to see the state. Um, but I think it's also important to, to highlight that borders are not smooth spaces uh, um, in, in a globalized era as well, despite these narratives of fluidity um, uh, that exist. I think it shows not only the boundaries of the territorial waters, but I think it, th there's a very interesting aesthetic uh, around this, um, which highlights the jagged manifestation of the border, contrary to these, um, these uh, narratives in, in, in the context of globalization. Um, this is a form of uh, um, blockade uh, production occurring at sea and then serves as a mechanism uh, to make the, the fluid spaces of the sea harder and more impervious uh, to regularize migrants. 
Um, so quickly, how, how did I uh, look at some of this stuff? So very briefly on the methodology, I spent uh, um, several months uh, living and working with uh, particularly the one German NGO Sea-Watch um, as they uh, um, were under various um, uh, periods of, of detention. Uh, first here in, uh, in Marseille, um, the majority of my time was spent uh, in Lakata in Sicily, but also a little bit of time in Malta. Uh, as well. And so I conducted a bunch of interviews with them and I was engaged in uh, some activist ethnography with them, um, basically trying to, to uh, uh, situate myself in this work, uh, be able to, to um, again, live and work alongside the, the uh, individuals that I'm, uh, I'm engaging with here. So, uh, but to, to quickly contextualize um, sort of what is, what, what is going on. So what are we actually looking at? I've talked about a few different things so far. So first of all, the the the, inner, the the main focus here is on the idea of search and rescue, um, and this is uh, uh, the the act of uh, as it sounds um, when boats are distressed, uh, ships go out, they search and they rescue and they disembark in a port of safety. So the primary kind of area of focus for me in this is the Central Mediterranean from 2014 on. You uh, see a bit of a light map <laughs> uh, highlighting. Um, the kind of different uh, sections of the Mediterranean and the depths associated with it. So we have the uh, Western Mediterranean over here, the uh, Eastern Med and Aegean, uh, and, and Central Med. And so right here is kind of the focus of my research um, with migrants uh, departing from North Africa primarily. Um, and so what I look at is uh, the, the role of civil society, uh, search and rescue vessels, and activists that are engaged uh, in search and rescue work. And so in 2014, 2015, we see uh, a number of uh, NGOs uh, getting uh, or forming to go out and conduct uh, uh, rescue operations uh, at sea. And so the, um, in, in terms of how this work is done, uh, you know, it happens uh, both at sea in terms of uh, rescuing boats, uh, happens on land in terms of the advocacy uh, work that they're engaged in, but also in the air in terms of aerial monitoring. Um, and uh, so largely what we're seeing is, is uh, uh, people leaving uh, Middle East, North Africa, but also Sub-Saharan Africa uh, too. But this is largely tied to um, sort of broader histories of, of uh, uh, colonialism uh, and imperial expansion, but also uh, the sort of uh, extended um, uh, destabilization that has, has uh, occurred as a result. Currently, there are no, there are no sort of EU going uh, EU seagoing missions, and now primarily it is based uh, search and rescue in the Mediterranean. Uh, on the state side of things, is largely um, relegated to aerial monitoring and drone surveillance. Um, uh, so, just to quickly kind of talk through some of um, how this works. Um, uh, again, in the in the in the case that I showed earlier, we saw. Uh, sort of that that um, uh, vis visual manifestation of what the uh, standoff uh, looks like. Um, but to talk through some of uh, the different legal frameworks that govern this process. So search and rescue is importantly governed by multiple overlapping legal jurisdictions. And, and I think this is actually one of the keys to um, the, 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 the strength or the, uh, um, yeah, the strength of, of these, uh, this process because um, there's, there's so many different angles that are, are uh, again, contributing to legitimize and justify this work um, from, a, from a legal standpoint. Now, um, uh, again, there's a, a number of multilateral frameworks uh, that are associated with this, um, including the UN Convention on the Law of Sea, oh, previous slide. Um, the Safety of Life at Sea Convention, the Search and Rescue Convention, uh, and the Ref, uh, Refugee Convention as well. But what, what's important in all of these is that there is a duty to render assistance that anyone in, uh, uh, in a position of distress at sea um, must be assisted uh, and they must be disembarked in a port of safety. So the idea is that boats uh, uh, need to um, work with one another uh, as both a kind of legal, not only just a legal obligation, um, but a, a broader sort of seafarers code. Um, and so all of these kind of work together uh, theoretically to justify or legitimize um, the, uh, uh, the practice of search and rescue. And while the sea may kind of appear as this, um, uh, as this open and empty space, uh, there are kind of multiple intersecting lines that crisscross over, uh, over the sea, dividing up um, 
uh, dividing up that space. It, it, in many senses, it becomes sort of an establishment of what on terms of variegated sovereignty, where sort of at, at different points in the um, uh, at sea, different sort of levels of sovereignty exist. And so um, in the territorial sea, uh, which is 12 nautical miles, uh, basically this is sort of an understood as an extension of uh, the, the, the state uh, land territory in, in effect. The contiguous zone um, extends that beyond to 24 nautical miles, and, and that 24 nautical mile zone is really what is understood as uh, as a kind of, or largely in practice understood as a uh, kind of purely state space. But once you start moving beyond that, um, especially in the Mediterranean, this is where we uh, start to get a little bit more um, ambiguity. Uh, and uh, but then, so on top of the uh, different forms of of territorial waters, contiguous zones, high seas, all that kind of stuff that exists at sea. We also have search and rescue zones that are mapped on top of that as well. And so you can't read this, but unfortunately, but it it, uh, it says uh, like Libyan SAR zone, multi SAR zone, Italian SAR zone, uh, and I think this is the Greek SAR zone. Um, but basically, what this is showing is that um, in the sea, not only it has these different lines to establish uh, sovereign sovereign authority and power in different spaces. But these SAR zones also kind of extend uh, a, a different form of border into the sea, which um, means that uh, the state that is responsible for the search and rescue zone is, is responsible to coordinate um, coordinate the search and rescue efforts that, that uh, occur after that. That doesn't necessarily mean that they need to disembark uh, in that port, but that they are the responsible state for coordinating these actions. And again, the two things uh, to... to um, to keep in mind uh, is the obligations associated with uh, the various legal frameworks. Um, and this is largely centered around the duty to render assistance and uh, that there's a need for disembarkation and for safety. Um, so, um, yeah, I think altogether, um, you know, the sea is a really important and unique space of politics. Uh, which, uh, or sorry, highlights the complicated politics of migration, mobility, and borders occurring uh, in, in the Med. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's really important here to, to keep in mind that the sea is kind of this, this combination or this, this uh, contradiction, rather, uh, of, of seemingly uh, uh, appearing as a pseudo anarchic space, but also a, a, um, a space of hyper regulation. Um, governed by legal frameworks, treaties, and conventions that all kind of work together. And so there's these odd contradictions that take place um, in the Mediterranean, but it's a very important space uh, for understanding the broader politics of play. So um, what, uh, well, I've been talking a lot about this idea of a standoff, well, what, what is it? Um, so I situate standoffs effectively as a form of blockade production that is tied to a wider criminalization of solidarity occurring at sea. So effectively what this does is it uses legal mechanisms predicated on sovereign territorial authority uh, to justify uh, the, um, uh, the, the exclusion of uh, particularly NGO ships uh, is, is where the target is. Um, but this works on both sides. And so uh, in, in terms of um, uh, it being a form of both entry and exit control. Um, and so oftentimes what happens uh, is a stage will block or bar the entry uh, leading to uh, of, of NGO rescue ships, uh, leading to prolonged periods of waiting at sea um, as states are unwilling to disembark those migrants, uh, the migrants on board. Um, and, and really what we're seeing is kind of emerging, uh, an emerging geography of containment existing beyond the EU uh, territorial borders or European territorial borders. Um, and again, I suggest that this exists as a form of bureaucratic blockading. And so what I mean by this is it, it, it's effectively leveraging um, seeming, seemingly benign or uh, mundane bureaucratic, administrative, and legal tools as means of keeping boats uh, uh, either at sea and reasserting sovereign authority over the Mediterranean, or uh, the flip side is by keeping, um, by, by blocking states from returning to the sea, uh, as a means of uh, separating NGOs from uh, the work that they're engaged with. And I, I suggest that this serves as a form of punitive, uh, um, uh, a punitive and deliberate act of retribution against uh, uh, NGOs and people on the move um, that is, is very directly tied uh, to, or is very directly associated with, with trying to stop um, or, or impede uh, this work. And a lot of this, and now this has, has been occurring for, for a significant, uh, sure, sorry, this has been occurring for a while, 
Um, but one of the points of uh, that that we um, can look to, or, or one point that is important to look to, is is the rise of um, uh, the far right interior minister and then Deputy Prime Minister Matteo Salvini, who kind of rose to power on this idea of anti-migrant uh, sentiment. He made declarations around closing ports uh, to um, the civil fleet. He uh, then brought in a series of um, uh, the imposition of, of high fines and criminal sanctions. He made declarations around stopping uh, illegal immigration and threatened to deport over 500,000 uh, irregularized individuals in, in Italy. And, and several activists that I worked with in, in this time have, have pointed to um, his rise as a really important turning point um, in, uh, in the process. And though while he's been ousted, these same efforts are being uh, uh, continued and, and, uh, and even expanded under the new Maloney government. But standoffs as well are also not necessarily a, a new um, experience. We've seen this before uh, in the Mediterranean. This has existed elsewhere, but in terms of uh, the context of sort of the uh, you know, the, the so-called Mediterranean um, uh, crisis. Um, you know, we first see this occurring with uh, the Cap and Amur in uh, 2004. And so this is a, a shift, but it's one on the top there. Um, it is, uh, it's a, it was a small humanitarian uh, aid vessel that was out uh, uh, on an engine test. Uh, at the time they uh, uh, came across a, a, a boat that had uh, debarked, or, um, uh, departed from uh, uh, Tunisia, uh, and uh, when they tried to uh, disembark in Italy after following that rescue, uh, they were um, denied and were left at sea for 12 days. And so um, upon entry, uh, the crew was arrested in charge. And, and even though there was a kind of a years long, uh, um, or this, this led to a years long uh, legal proceedings, uh, and, and there was an eventual acquittal, but I think this kind of provides a troubling foreshadowing of what, uh, what was eventually to come. Uh, in terms of the, the now sort of new normal that we're seeing in the Mediterranean. We also see this occurring with fishing and commercial vessels, and I think this is kind of an interesting one as well. Um, so they, these are either, uh, in the case of the uh, West Romare uh, Loreto, that was a just small fishing vessel that uh, was in, that, um, had rescued, uh, again, another small boat, um, but were uh, uh, initially told to disembark in Libya and there's objection. They they rejected that uh, that call, and as a result, they were not um, they were allowed they were not allowed to disembark. Uh, and again, a huge uh, huge delay around that. But in terms of these commercial vessels, these are, are I think uh, two really I mean they're interesting, but also very highly problematic. We have the uh, MD Italia and the Mers uh from uh, in in 2020, and basically uh, what we, we see with both of those. Um, are again very long protracted uh, standoffs that occurred as a result of commercial ships uh, coming across boats in distress uh, in the central Mediterranean. It's a, it's a hugely popular, uh, obviously shipping uh, and, and uh, shipping uh, corridor. Um, very, uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of different boats, a lot of different um, vessels kind of moving through that space, and so these kind of things happen occasionally. Um, but again, this led to, uh, uh, in the case of the uh, Chan, I believe that was uh, the longest documented uh, um, standoff that they've, they've had in the Mediterranean context, which was over uh, over three weeks, um, or uh, oh, yeah, almost a month, I believe. And, but I think one of the most curious ones is the, the state vessels, that, that they too are caught in this, uh, in this standoff politics as well. So we have the case of the Gitati and the Gregoretti. And in both of these cases, um, these are Italian Coast Guard vessels that were engaged in the work of Coast Guards uh, in, in conducting search and rescue. But uh, the Salvini uh, government at the time um, blocked the Italian flag ships from entering the town port, which is in the Italian context actually like a constitutional violation as well. Um, but uh, this is also, uh, it led to, again, several days being, being kept at sea. Um, uh, before they were allowed to uh, disembark. And this actually has led to subsequent uh, charges against uh, Salvini for uh, on the basis or on the grounds of, uh, of kidnapping, actually. Um, so we see this kind of, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so we see this uh, uh, occurring in, in a bunch of different um, ways, but I, I want to quickly turn to sort of what, uh, how this works to produce uh, or, or how standoffs um, kind of uh, work to produce the blockade. And so there's three kind of different elements to this that I see. Um, so one is kind of viewing, viewing standoffs and blockade production as a form of spectacle. 
Um, and so the act of making migrants and NGOs visible through the standoff, um, through standoff spectacle allows, and I, I think more importantly, justifies increasing security measures that are often conveyed as a means of protecting um, uh, state sovereignty or sovereign space, uh, as well as um, reaffirming protections over the borders. But I think importantly, it's actually a form of political theater um, situated in these narratives of crisis and criminality. Um, and, and, and it's done to project to multiple audiences um, the uh, ability to, or, or signaling or affirming contr control uh, over the space of the sea. Um, you know, boats will be disembarked, uh, but it's unsure when, and, and I'll return to that temporal uh, uncertainty in a moment. But for both domestic and, and regional audiences, it's kind of a wider effort to show that, that migrant bodies and NGOs are not welcome. But I think it's also important in making, um, making these bodies uh, legible and visible to the state. And so I think that this, uh, uh, this occurs both by highlighting um, both the, uh, the migrants on board, again, there's a, there's a lot of literature looking around um, how the kind of visual construction of crisis uh, in these instances um, you know, draws on narratives around, uh, uh, you know, deviant masculinity. Uh, these are, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, criminalized men that are, are coming to take jobs and all that kind of stuff. So we see all these kind of narratives emerging around uh, how, uh, how these instances are talked about or, or uh, produced, both by uh, the media, states, um, and, and also in some ways NGOs. Um, so, uh, I also view, um, oh, sorry. Uh, but yeah, so um, this is really, this becomes important for delegitimizing non state actors in, in search and rescue because part of the narrative around this is that these, uh, the civil fleet does not have sort of legitimate claim to presence of, uh, yet in the sea. That the sea is understood almost as a state space. Uh, and so what, what the standoff does is it effectively projects to broader populations that um, uh, these actors that we are as, uh, you know, as a responsible state holding at sea, um, they do not have legitimate presence in, in what they're doing and trying to, to delegitimize them and put them more into this criminal um, narrative. But, and, and so I think oftentimes, uh, the civil fleet is projected as a, a nuisance at best, um, but more problematically, I think, as lawbreakers and criminals that are complicit uh, in facilitating, uh, you know, smuggling or anything like that. But really what happens in, in this spectacle side of things is, is, again, it's about signaling control and claiming uh, the space of the sea. So I think it also, uh, the standoff also exists as a form of spatiotemporal containment, so controlling time and space. Um, blockading port entry, you know, it, what it does is it delays disembarkation and asylum claim. But I think more, more, more problematically, it, it injects further uncertainty into the migrant journey. And I, I argue that the emergence and persistence of standoff politics in the Mediterranean operates kind of as a mechanism uh, or a, as a technology of governing the sea. And far more problematically, um, it serves as a form of enacting uh, a retribution or challenging state authority as, as uh, again, uh, NGOs and people on the move become kind of the collateral canvas on which uh, states project this ability to control. And um, uh, yeah, so I think that uh, this is really important. Um, uh, yeah, it, 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 it sorry, uh, I'm just a little lost. Uh, yeah, so it contributes to, um, uh, structuring and filtering the, the mobility of uh, individuals uh, involved. And, and again, this has an impact, I think, both on, on people on the move and uh, in NGOs themselves. Um, and in fact, what it does is it leads to this uh, sort of interstitial carcerality. So the sea then becomes transformed into a carceral space, as, as uh, Murray Cyril talks about. Um, or producing islands of exceptionalism, as as also Mounts refers. Um, but in effect, um, you know, NGO ships become transformed from these spaces spaces of, of liberation uh, uh, and escape to to capture and increasingly detention, um, where people have uh, have left North Africa, um, but not yet arrived in Europe, and and are in effect stuck in this interstitial space of, of 
uh, weighting and indeterminacy. Um, but uh, third, and I think most importantly, the standoff represents uh, a form of retribution and retaliation. And, and how the, this works in a couple different ways. That's sort of the um, more basic uh, or, or benign level. It's a, you know it, it has an impact on resources and logistics in terms of the the time uh, and money uh, that it takes to run these organizations um, uh, are 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 hampered as a result of the criminalization uh, taking place. Um, in the Mediterranean, and so it's not—it's not just about uh, pe keeping people on the move at bay, but it's also about hampering the uh, efficacy of these search and rescue um, NGOs. Uh, and and it also serves to make kind of the operational planning more difficult, as they need to prepare for extended time at sea. Um, and this really hadn't been a consideration uh, before, but something that has evolved uh, throughout time. But I think more nefariously, it's about punishing. It's this punitive angle. It's about punishing bodies. Um, and I see this as, uh, and this occurs through the uh, extended periods of time um, kept at sea and leading to you know, exhaustion and psychological trauma. The sea is a very difficult space to exist, uh, even for those with experience. And, and uh, oftentimes what happens in these standoffs is, uh, you know, the ships will be held within, uh, you know, within sight line of, um, of the shore, but not able to actually reach that space. It becomes... I think a very targeted and calculated uh, uh, punitive mechanism to, uh, again, increase the psychological and physical harm um, to both NGOs and, uh, uh, and people on the move themselves. And I suggest that this isn't, this isn't necessarily like a passive, or this, sorry, this isn't passive indifference, but rather this is an act, actual, like an active effort uh, to close the window um, to NGOs uh, uh, operating in the Mediterranean to try and push them further and further uh, from from the sea, um, and uh, again as a, as a means of hampering that, that that work. But I think in we see this actually occurring, uh, or, or a new sort of manifestation of this uh, occurring during COVID nineteen. And so uh, what happened is as the pandemic was expanding, um, uh, and obviously there's a massive decline in uh, cruise ship tourism uh, in the central Mediterranean. Um, the Maltese and Italian government chartered uh, several cruise ships and tour boats uh, to um, use these as sort of an extended uh, uh, period of at sea detention. And so, what happened in these cases, uh, individuals were uh, rescued uh, by uh, civil fleet ships, but then they were transferred from that ship uh, onto another ship, uh, either th there's a um, the cruise ship here, and this is actually a, from Malta, it's a, it's a very small uh, harbor cruiser, so you basically go around, it's, it's, it's a day trip boat for tourists, uh, and what they did is they transferred migrants onto these, uh, onto these ships and uh, left them there uh, for an anti-quarantine period as a result of, uh, you know, um, or as a result of COVID. And again, I think what it does is it draws on, you know, very familiar narratives around, uh, um, you know, migrants as uh, harbingers of disease and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and, and kind of really utilizing uh, COVID as a means to, again, keep, keep people further at sea, because while at sea, it delays the ability for asylum claims to be made. Um, and again, it's, it's this injection of uncertainty into the, the journey that, again, uh, has, a, has a very punitive kind of uh, aspect to it. Um, very much, I think, tied to sort of prevention through deterrence narratives that we see uh, here, that we've seen on, on the US-Mexico border as well. Um, but again, to, to, to continue to, uh, you know, take the extreme circumstances of COVID and uh, amplify those uh, to ensure that, like, even in the most dire situations that, uh, you know, this continues to be um, uh, used against uh, uh, migrants as they're as they're um, kept at, at bay. Um, so, so uh, forty minutes all together. So that's okay. So I'll uh, yeah I'll I'll start. Yeah, let's show. So, um, so yeah, just, and this is we're all I'll try and bring some of this together. So I look at uh, the standoff politics uh, as um, um, part of a wider criminalization uh, taking place and, and a really, I would argue, troubling trend in the Mediterranean. 
Because we're seeing a, a sustained effort to criminalize all non-state actors involved in, in search and rescue operations, but this also coincides with a, a drawdown of EU seagoing missions as well. Um, previously, we've had um, uh, uh, Triton, Triton um, Sophia, Uniform Med, um, uh, Irene Now, um, several different uh, organizations that, or sorry, several several different missions that have um uh either uh, been drawn down or are now relegated to uh strictly aerial monitoring um and also too it, you know it's led to uh a, a number of organizations being pushed out of the SAR process through um these uh bureaucratic and legal attacks on their on their work um sea watch the organization that I've, I've worked most with uh has found themselves facing numerous uh, detentions and, and periods of law, um uh bureaucratic and legal attacks on, on, on their work as well, um, including uh, criminal and administrative investigations by uh, state authorities. Um, and uh, I, I think it's interesting like that how how the bureau, how these uh, how this functions as kind of a um, it, it was a representation of kind of like the minor politics of criminalization. It's this isn't occurring in uh, especially on the bureau, on the bureaucratic side of things. It doesn't necessarily always occur in these these uh, broad moments of spectacle, it happens in some of these minor and benign times uh, as well, and and then through these administrative processes. And one of that is uh, one of the first kind of uh, indications we see is with the code of conduct in 2017. So this was brought in by uh, then um, uh, Italian um, Interior Minister Marco Minetti, um, and uh, this was again came in 2017. At the time. Uh, the civil police had conducted uh, approximately one third of all rescues taking place in the central Mediterranean, and so this was kind of brought in as a mechanism as a mechanism to standardize um, uh, uh, search and rescue operations. So, um, but really, what what it did is it established uh, a series of thirteen different divisions um, and, and, to, and requirements that largely reiterated the um, the legal requirements uh, stipulated under the UN Law of the Sea. Um, so let's mention all these other kind of pre-existing legal frameworks uh, and um, uh, suggested that all, all of these state actors must follow these, you know, this new set of rules, again, despite already largely, largely doing so. Uh, among these demands were um, placed in the code, uh, you know, there were, there were several around, again, you know, respecting um, territorial waters of, of states. Um, uh, Another one uh, suggested that NGOs were not allowed to switch off their AIS um, geolocation systems. That that little that system that created the map that we saw um, initially. Um, and you know, I think while while these instances might seem benign, I think uh, you know, in particular, demands like this insinuate that um, uh, NGOs are kind of routinely engaging in in this practice uh, that allows them to become sort of invisible to. Um, marine tracking software, um, and uh, you know, also kind of again, it suggests that there is something nefarious taking place, and I think that's that's part of what uh, what this is working to do is inject some of that uncertainty um, into the process. And so, in the code of contact, largely, um, you know, there, the majority of the uh, regulations, people were like, yeah, whatever, we're, we're already doing this anyways, and so fine, we'll, we'll sign on to that. But there were three really important. Um, points of contention. One was around transshipment. So basically, ships were uh, previously um, civil fleet would uh, uh, be engaged in a rescue. They would transfer that to the um, those on board to the larger ship, uh, often a faster ship that's capable of taking people um, to Europe. And that that uh, previously was either other NGOs uh, with with greater capacity, or uh, oftentimes working very closely with. Um, state Navy and Coast Guard vessels as well. Um, uh, so what they were trying to do, uh, or what this what this particular move did, is it said that you're no longer allowed to do that. And what that meant is that uh, instead of being able to um, uh, stay at sea, ships were now required, or uh, the civil fleet was now required to return back to Europe. Um, often increasing the amount of time uh, that they are then sort of separated from the work that's being done because. What eventually happens is, you know, uh, when um, a it leads to the standoff, uh, standoff process, but also the these administrative and legal uh, investigations that follow again often means that that ships will be out of action for months at a time. 
Um, uh, Another, another point of contention was around the cooperation with security forces, basically requiring them to turn over any data that was gathered to, um, to police. Uh, and, and one of the most contentious was around uh, allowing, allowing police um, and state officials uh, on, uh, on board the ships to actually conduct investigations. And while there are some NGOs that that you know willingly acquiesce to this, uh, it, it, uh, others uh, uh, push back, especially on some of these um, final points, and and that became a very important kind of political division uh, amongst the civil fleet. But then I think so. This uh, the code of conduct is largely targeted at sort of the um, the operations while at sea. But the uh, what we then see with these SPS regulations uh, that come in, and also the Salvini decree, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, you know we. Uh, we see kind of uh, an escalation uh, in uh, in some of this work that then targets uh, again some of the smaller aspects um, uh, of the search and rescue process. So, um, uh, with the SPS regulations, so what this stands for is special purpose ships. So, how uh, these NGOs operate at sea is under a SPS designation. But what this did. Um, it sets uh, physical and normative standards that each ship is governed by, uh, which is administered by the, the flag state of whatever ship they are, uh, or sorry, flag state of uh, whatever flag they're flying on, on that ship. It doesn't necessarily need to be the ship that they are, the state that they are associated with um, uh, or from, uh, but it's, it's more of a legal kind of um, uh, connection. But, um, what these did is it, uh, they went through and it basically increased the number of, uh, inspections, uh, that were required of the ships. There was more stringent security and maintenance requirements. Um, and, and, but, and really I think what we see here, like this is one that is, is very clearly targeted at, um, uh, again, at basically just throwing as many things in front of the way as possible. Uh, to slow and hamper um, the work of these organizations, it, it becomes in effect a you know death by a thousand cuts of, of all these little minor um, minor instances. As one example, a very you know very minor and very you know um, uh, you know non-existent problems being brought to the fore that 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 emerged as a result of, of some of these actions. Um, uh, I, I was talking with a, a medic while in field work, and she uh, she was. Talking about some of the absurdity uh, around, uh, or talking about the absurdity of some of these changes. So, and also like the inventiveness uh, around it too, um, with these constant imposition uh, of, of new regulations for SAR ships. And she talked about it in terms of uh, it, now that there's, you know, there's now a requirement for the number of condoms that, uh, that, that uh, rescue ships must have on board if we're going to see. She says, I mean, there's a regulation on how many condoms we have to have on board. Uh, I had to go and buy, well, not me personally, but um, uh, the medical department now possesses condoms for inspectors, basically. Uh, we expect everyone to, you know, bring their own. Um, the only way uh, to make a stop is really, really, really stop us. You have to make us stop. Um, so far, we have always, always found a way around. And honestly, if I have to buy 50 condoms, if a medical inspector wants to see them, I will show them. And so, uh, again, it's these, it's these, uh, it's, it's the efforts to take, uh, again, very seemingly uh, innocuous uh, sort of requirements um, and, and putting this constant multiplication of, of them onto the NGOs, again, kind of as a, uh, as a means to, to, to frustrate, hamper, and, and slow the work that is being done. But there's another uh, example uh, where MSF, um, uh, faced, an, faced an investigation around uh, what was, they, they, they said there was, um, it was around the uh, disposal of HIV infected clothing, um, which is not a thing. Um, but uh, again, what it does is it, 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 it draws on some of these similar narratives that, uh, you know, migrants are uh, disease carriers, that um, uh, somehow the NGOs involved in this type of work are now not only actively in, involved in you know smuggling or or whatever as as, as they're, they're often accused, but that uh, you know they're they are actively spreading the disease as well. That the NGOs are contributing to this this too. Um, 
And you know, so the the, the criminalization manifests in, in in so many different ways. And, and again, the the there's a really ironic kind of justification to some of these changes that take place. So in the Sea Watch context, um, uh, the the Dutch government was the uh, the flag state at the time brazenly alleged that part of their operation or their opposition to the work of these organizations is that you know they didn't want um uh they didn't want or they didn't like the idea that people were being kept on on board these ships for extended periods of time um and it creates really inhumane conditions and so part of what they're trying to do is improve the the conditions on board the ships so that you know if they're stuck there for longer periods of time it's you know their their um their safety and care is being met and then, i mean it seems it seems to be uh, like a legitimate concern, but I think that the, the perverse logic offered here points to the harmful situation created by standoffs is really, you know, they're, they're suggesting that this is predicated on um, care and concern for people on the move, but in, in effect, what they were doing is suggesting that, um, you know, the conditions on uh, being, of having people um, caught in standoffs for long periods of time you know, it's not safe uh, to be stuck at sea for for long periods of time. It's 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 very difficult and challenging um, to su subject people to that. Um, and this is you know this is an absolutely stunning failure to acknowledge the harmful conditions that that the state itself is contributing to um, producing to ensure that people are kept at sea for a long period of, uh, of time as a, as a direct result of these calculated state efforts to impede SAR operations. Um, you know. Uh, in in this kind of logic, drowning at sea is effectively positioned as a safer alternative to being stuck on board the ship. And and really, it it this is a I think a very clear kind of representation of this this bureaucratic blockading that keeps uh, NGOs from um, uh, you know from returning to sea. The standoff becomes part of the blockade production. Um, while the, the legal and administrative mechanisms are used to impede their work uh, as a means of, of blockading um, uh, exit as well. Um, and, and yeah, of course, it is it is inhumane to uh, keep people on boats for, for an extended period of time, but it's not as a result of the work of, of NGOs themselves. It's because of the political maneuvers uh, of European states, which, you know, serves to then transform NGO ships into these carceral spaces of indefinite detention. You know, this is not indifference. This is a calculated political effort to uh, utilize the inhospitable um, conditions of the sea as, as a means of removing NGOs from the, the life-saving systems they engage. As uh, one, one actor says, um, we've seen for years the shipwrecks in that area. We know the cause. We know how it happens. And most of all, uh, and most importantly, that it won't stop. People won't stop coming just because there are no rescue vessels there. And this really, I think, captures uh, uh, what is at stake in this. Uh, because the because rescue ships are not there, it doesn't mean that people will stop uh, coming. But what it does mean is that people will continue uh, uh, to to die or or find themselves in very positions as a result. So, in conclusion, um, uh, I. Uh, th this work kind of looks at the transform transformation of NGO ships into interstitial spaces of waiting um, as kind of a technology of governing local populations. I think it animates the sea as a contested borderscape as, um, again, the civil fleet, I think, continues to push back against state efforts to, to remove them from, um, from the sea. Um, stand-up blockades and, and or start stand-up politics and bureaucratic blockading functions as a punitive retribution uh, against people on the move and the civil fleet for the continual disruption of regional boarding practices. And I think it animates the European strategy of containment that can that produces uh, civil fleet boats as offshore mobile border sites um, that I think signals the escalation and evolution of the criminalization of boat migration in solidarity at sea. Um, uh, while the criminalization of solidarity uh, or of rescue um, occurs through uh, the more overt criminal investigations into uh, SAR operations, it also functions in more benign and bureaucratic ways and seek to bleed NGOs of time, money, and resources to solve and impede their operations. The criminalization is, is really less about actually putting people in jail and more about slowing uh, and, and uh, um, straining SAR missions uh, in an effort to slowly push them from the sea. This is not the, the criminalization uh, of, of uh, rescue 
um, and the emergence of standoff politics this is not accidental. This is not a bug of the system, um, but this is a, a feature uh, of boarding practice in, in these liminal spaces uh, between the global movement. And so, and I will end it there. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments? Yeah, Jeff. Thanks, uh, Michael. This is really great. Um, I really. <clears throat> Like your analysis is kind of bringing together all the different, just showcasing how, you know, these are intentional strategies and tactics, and there's all these side effects, and um, and the ambiguity of the space. I, I, for me, I just kept on thinking of the U.S.-Mexico border space because that's where I, you know, focus my work, and um, so much of what you were talking about resonated and has been looked at, you know, just at least a little bit by scholars. Um, in this area, you know, how asylum, the asylum processing now is becoming more and more, uh, you know, a spatial temporal containment uh, um, space uh, as they externalize it. And there's, um, there's these bureaucratic and legal mechanisms being used to keep people from being able to um, cross the border or access, you know, safety and the physical and psychological harm that comes from that. And kind of like, you know, Jason Leal's work and Jeremy Slack, yeah. which I'm sure you're looking at. So it's just curious. Um, uh, Leo Chavez talks about the border spectacle, and it's funny because it kind of starts around like 2014, too, which is when the child migrant images came out and detention. And, and then we have, you know, 27, 28, 29 images of caravans. And so it was just interesting to think about the kinds of even temporal parallels of what's going on in Europe and not really knowing much about that context. Um, but I did some work with no more deaths in the desert in Arizona, and um, there it's really an ambiguous space. Mm -hmm. You should kind of a line in the sand, you know. There's all this contentious politics going on there between NGOs and you know, humanitarian organizations that were searching and rescuing and, and providing aid and, and that um, being criminalized and you know through different tactics. So just curious if you if you've started to explore that at all, you're here, like looking at the context here. Have you had any chance to talk to um, any of the organizations working in this space? If you're thinking about putting your working conversation with that at some point yeah. or some article down the line, and then I was also just I was just struck by the difference too, which is just these majestic issues of uh, uh, images of, of vessels and the blockading and the jaggedness of the ocean and you know the sea, just being this vast space uh, that's so fluid. Um, and hard to manage, um, and the spectacle behind that. So I was, I was just intrigued by the difference in the context too. But it's just, it, it really is like this interesting area to look for a spatial, to do a spatial analysis. And I was wondering if you spent much time at sea. I didn't. You said you were doing working with Seawash, but it wasn't clear exactly what your fieldwork looked like. Yeah. If you were out in boats, if you were talking to people on land, or, or yeah, what you did, what you did. Yeah, so um, yeah, on a couple of those things. I mean, maybe we're all kind of work in reverse order. So, it, in the on the sort of methodological side of things, that was actually my intent was to try and try and go to see. Um, and that was something that I had, uh, you know, I kind of worked throughout that entire time to make happen. But um, I just so happened to be around during these points of, of detention, uh, and so I either missed uh, missed a rotation um, or. Uh, when I went to join, the only thing that was happening is that people were like there was a it was at some point of detention, uh, and so what that meant. Uh, I mean, research wise, uh, it it was fortunate in that you know it, it meant that everyone was there. It, it sort of in some ways made things easier from a personal research standpoint um, because it, it, it meant that I had more easy access to be able to, to stay with, with the ship for a longer period of time because oftentimes people will be, you know, for, for mission, you're kind of on like a, you know, 20 to 30 day like cycle. You kind of come in for a month, um, some pre time, some mission time, and then some post uh, uh, post time. So, um, uh, but anyways, the the times that I was, or the, during that time that I was there was pretty much intended. The only, Point that I, I wasn't there was actually the uh, there were there were two missions that when I both got detained um, and uh, I uh, fortunately unfortunately missed both those uh, chances because the the, the roster was full for, for those missions. Um, 
but yeah, so then uh, maybe to, to step back to the spatial side of things, uh, I think that, yeah, I think that's one of the things that's really interesting and, and actually, um, you know, also ties to where like my work is is trying to go now. And so, uh, or, or where I'm wanting to go um, with some of this, and this is on the kind of comparative angle uh, of things and looking at, because uh, I think that there is something very interesting about the spatial politics of the sea, but also, you know, the desert. I think there's a lot of, you know, despite being similarly or uh, seemingly like very disparate spaces, I think there's a lot of similarity um, there in terms of how they become, you know, uh, uh, utilized as, as border spaces. But I think there's also um, really important uh, questions about how, you know, non-state actors are able to challenge sovereign authority in those spaces um, uh, through that work. And so one of the things that I'm wanting to, to do and, and to uh, answer that. I, I haven't I haven't actually started uh, meeting with people yet, and that's something that I would I would like to do. And um, now uh, now that I have a slightly more current employment for the next little bit, I, I should be able to do should be able to do some of that. Um, but kind of looking at sort of how the uh, you know how the different organizations like understand the work that they're involved in, how they kind of position themselves uh, in that. You know, is this coming from Sort of more altruistic forms of humanitarianism, or is this like a more radical, like anti-statist, uh, you know, resistance to border violence or something like that? And kind of trying to tease out some of the different, you know, similarities and differences that occur in, in those two spaces. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, all I can say haven't haven't got there yet. But that's exactly that's actually exactly where where the work is going is kind of trying to because I think there's there's so much not only uh, not only um, in terms of the, the comparative side of things there, uh, you know, but I think that Europe has learned a lot from the, the U.S. bordering efforts on uh, with Mexico. I think that you know the the how uh, the American government has approached border has become, I, I think, uh, again, and looking at how that that kind of mentality has been executed. Um, externally as well, uh, and I think that uh, Europe has learned quite a bit from the the European countries. So, so I have a question. I mean, where I can imagine that you're positioning yourself against the way that the Italian government talks about these things, but theoretically, who are you positioning yourself against? Uh, in in what in what in terms of the overall argument of the of the work. Yeah, so um, I mean, I I largely uh, um, the the work largely draws on some of the critical border studies uh, literature, um, and, and I'm actually and this is kind of you know so I was trained in political science, uh, but I mean my work is is I think a lot more uh, has a lot more of a geographical focus to it uh, as well, and so. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, a lot of this work is is built off of, uh, you know, particularly around uh, William Walsh's work on governmentality and how um, uh, how that is kind of employed uh, in the government's mobility. Um, uh, you know, Maurice Stirrell, I think Maurice Stirrell has done some of the most important work uh, in terms of uh, framing and contextualizing um, not only the spatial aspects, but like the political dynamics um, um, with this too. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that literature, I think, that um, that really does a good job, I think, engaging with, um, with some of this. And so part of what I'm trying to do in, in this is sort of bring together some of these um, some of these these strands that, that I've kind of picked up through, through my research and I'm kind of trying to tie tie some of them together. But just to understand, I mean, but do you also see some of their arguments as being wrong or inadequate, or is that not the kind of yeah you're trying to make there? I mean, it's not it's not necessarily. Um, so I think with this specifically, what you know, what I'm trying to uh, to to do is sort of like you know understand um, and be, and be able to explain to how. This, uh, you know, the importance of the this, the spatial dynamic uh, in in um, the standoff production uh, and, and blockade as well. I, um, you know, in terms of the the you know, do I do I how do I think about or maybe push back on some of this stuff? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't think that 
that uh, you know NGOs are the NGOs are necessarily perfect. I don't think that there's necessarily um, you know they are without fault uh, in you know every sort of aspect of, of what they do. I'm sure they're you know that it's, that's kind of many, that's how organizations or that's what happens within organizations. But I think that um, I think that uh, at sort of base level, what is being done is not only um, uh, important but it's necessary in this context. And so. I think until we get to a point where we're able to, you know, we, we can um, think beyond these like ad hoc responses to migration uh, in the Mediterranean. Um, if we can, you know, move, uh, you know, towards safe legal, um, uh, 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 safe and legal options for people to, to, to migrate, this is going to continue to be an, uh, an issue. And, I think that there's a necessity to this work in a in a you know an unfortunate way that this needs to continue. And so um yeah, I think that I and I also think that like the persistence of this work, um, or that that the the NGOs are continuing to persist in this despite all the obstacles that are are um that they're faced with, I think is you know an important uh or is an important testament to the the work that is being done and and the necessity. Um, the, the necessity of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so I, I have a question on um, the point that you made about the criminal criminalizing the activity of these NGOs, like Sea Watch, for example. But I'm wondering if you saw in your research that um, it might actually go beyond that in a sense, not criminalizing the actions per se, but actually criminalizing the actor. Mm. Um, I've seen. I don't think an academic, it was academic literature per se, but I've seen reports of, um, of, of states such like Italy trying to, at least in the political rhetoric, kind of equivocate these NGOs with the actual smugglers, mm -hmm. right? Which is an actual mm -hmm. criminal actor. Mm -hmm. or, in, or I would say that there's also the added complication factor. For example, if I remember that, that case you brought up in 2019, Carola herself is actually not Italian. She's German. Sure. And so then that brings up an issue of um, um, the, the kind of crimes of non-citizenship. You know, to 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 what extent are these actors also equivocated with the actual foreigners trying to quote unquote? And and but if the person was Italian, I wonder if there's a rhetoric kind of suggesting that that um that these NGO actors are just bad citizens. So in all these cases, it's a criminalization of the actor, not actually action. Yeah, that's happening, and that's what's needed in your research. Yeah, that um. Yeah, I think that's that's interesting um, because uh, yeah, the, the criminalization of the the uh, the actor, not the action. I mean, yeah, this is the, like uh, the the Corolla case. I think is is one one sort of instance. I, I I thought it was actually interesting about the 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 bad citizen angle that you talked about. I haven't actually thought about that, but I think that that's uh, uh, that's something. Um, uh, something to, to, to think about um uh but yeah i think that so what was, what was the first part of the question I, I, <laughs> yeah so maybe like um, if you're seeing any kind of equivocation um done by politicians oh right 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 yeah so i mean that is kind of one of the central narratives that that you see particularly from um the european political class is that uh the the ngos if they aren't um you know actively involved in smuggling they are facilitating they are cooperating they are working you know they're either it's either to the point of like well they're actually communicating with them and and, and involved in that which is not not in any way true but there's also you know there's also the justification or, or the um accusation that well, just being there is going to, you know, mean that people are going to come. And, and I think that, you know, there's been some interesting work that has, has looked at different periods of, uh, throughout the you know, last few years where uh, there haven't been you know, rescue ships. Uh, and, and it doesn't actually, you know, there's no real correlation between the, um, you know, ships being at sea and departures from, you know, there's a lot of other factors that are, you know, associated with that. And so despite, you um, you know, the efforts to characterize this work in this way, it's not actually borne, borne out or, 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 or shown in that way. 
but again, I think it, it's a very easy and convenient narrative to, to draw on for state actors that, uh, and again, I think that's part of what the spectacle is, is about. It's like, hey, what are these people? And and the uh, it's actually very interesting that you bring up the, the, uh, the citizenship angle too, because especially in the Italian context, one of the things that I think makes it even more contentious is that these are largely German organizations. There's one Spanish or, or um, uh, Italian organization, but they're largely German. And and so I think as a result, it, it adds some of that, like, well, what, it, you know, th this is just Germany dumping their problem onto us Italians. And, um, and I think that it, uh, you know, that's a, that's an, a, an, a really problematic kind of uh, narrative around it. Um, but I, again, I think it, it, it also points to there not really being any sort of formal reception process now that, that you know, it, particularly when it comes to disembarkation of um, obesity rescues, it's an ad hoc, it's largely an ad hoc response um, uh, where, you know, these standoffs occur because there's not actually any mechanism to make this happen, theoretically. Uh, and so each time, rather than kind of working through, uh, you know, sections of the framework around this, um, you know, they, they deal with these on an, on an ad hoc basis. And uh, I think that that, I, you know, I, I don't think that that's just indifference. I don't think that that is, you know, oh, uh, we can't come to an agreement on how to do this. I think that that because of what happens with these delays and with this inaction, is it actually continues, I would argue, a pretty pretty good thing for Europe. They can they can slow down time. They can continue to sort of, you know, muck up the works of, of NGOs by, you know, really kind of uh, come through an action or in, in some cases or, you know, actively trying to in others. Um, yeah, so. But isn't the Italian government allege that crimes took place in Italian territorial waters and so it doesn't really matter if the person is a German citizen or an Italian citizen or? Uh, yeah, that's a good, I mean, that's a great, I haven't, I haven't, that's right. I mean, if they came into the port of Lampedusa without, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not justifying the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. The, yeah. the way that the law has been written. Yeah. That, that, that's Italian, that's Italian territorial waters where the boat, the Italian, uh, I don't know, customs or native boat, whatever that was, was yeah. Blocked. That was also Italian water, right? Yeah, and so it, it, it was absolutely, and um, because I was actually in, in in the port, but I think that the, um, yeah, I mean, I do, I, I see what you're saying there, but I think that the, uh, I think what the organizations are, or where they're making that point or claim to defend the action is that they had a uh, a duty and obligation to disembark individuals. And and they you know they 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 followed the process and this you know repeated effort and it kind of as the situation deteriorates and gets to a point where like it then forces action and I think that again I think that 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 delay that that slowing is is important because whether or not that was the right action I, I think it was the right action uh, it forced. The organization to do something that again turned turned that event into something completely different as well. It, it now became a a question of you know this is a the imposition of a German ship on the Italian government. This is as I talk about you know Salvini declaring this is like a a, a declaration of war. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that they um, you know. They, they use, again, and part of the justification is, is it's using these pre-existing legal frameworks to justify the work that is being done. And so I think that the argument is in part in that context, well, we've done everything that you have suggested that we do. Now we're going to appeal to this kind of international level of law to then justify or legitimize that particular action. Whether you know like, again, I think that's maybe a debate for legal scholars to have about you know the the um, efficacy or or uh, accuracy of that. But yeah.
Yeah, I have a very small question, but I, I don't know much about the background, but I, it's a really interesting one. But I, I just wonder, is, is there any like a over time like a development of this uh, mechanism in your argument? I mean, because this work is basically based on your ethnographic work. So it's like, I think it's really, it's a, a kind of contextual yeah. at that time. So, but I mean, for example, like, are there any like a literature piece, this mechanism like, <laughs> happened a little bit more earlier? Or yeah, so um, this, uh, I mean, this, again, this has definitely happened or it has been happening before and will continue long after, you know, my, I'm, I'm done with that. Um, the, uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, ethnographics, I think, yeah, it is, it is definitely a contextually kind of limited uh, argument again in, in the movie. <laughs> Um, sort of the, the, that time time frame that that I was uh, I was looking at, um, but I think that you know the uh, the ethnographic stuff actually points. Uh, it's sort of uh, that comes out in some of the different um, some of the other stuff that I've uh, I've done. The this is uh, I think more um, yeah maybe like a, a theoretical engagement with the. Um, uh, that idea of le less so than drawing on the actual like ethnography as part of the <laughs> work. So we have a question from Kathy Kopanak, who I'll invite to. Thank you. Question. My yeah, question ahead. can you hear me? Yes. My question is a, a kind of political economy question. Um, do these when these boats are detained, do they um, run out of supplies like food and water? And if they do, um, who provides the supplies? Is it the state, um, private sector, um, the NGO, and who pays for them? I mean, I, I'm wondering, is there an industry that concretely profits from this detention? Yeah, that's, that's a... That's a really interesting question. I haven't I haven't actually thought about it in terms of. I mean, there's definitely, uh, you know, and there's a lot of work kind of around the obviously you know the political economy of, of borders and how this creates sort of its own industry in and of itself. Um, but I haven't necessarily thought about that um, in this particular context. But in terms of, like from sort of more of a pragmatic uh, side of things. Yeah, absolutely. With with some of the, and this is part of where that um, uh, that temporal indeterminacy is is a really problematic aspect, and and uh, because uh, you know obviously you're limited by, by the supplies that you have, and so as those drain with these extended periods, what ends up happening is they either need to court, or oftentimes or what has happened in the past where it has gotten to this point. Uh, uh, it's been um, coordinated with the NGO and the uh, generally the Coast Guard. And so what will happen is um, supplies will then be brought out uh, to the ship uh, and um, and transferred on to the ship itself while it's waiting. There was an, uh, there was an example or there's been examples where um, because uh, one of the how sort of the the uh, operational timelines work again on that like 30 day cycle or whatever. Um, they had uh, a number of people in, in one of the standoffs that uh, they they basically had to leave and go back to their life. And so they actually brought new crew out, took old crew off, and there's kind of an at sea crew change. Um, and uh, again, this is these are these are all sort of um, uh, you know different small little like bureaucratic mechanisms to try and, uh, I, I think, uh, frustrate some of uh, uh, the work. Um, but again, all of this cost is is borne, or, or the cost is largely borne by the NGOs themselves. And, and again, this is part of why it becomes so difficult, because as I said, these ships are very, very expensive to run, um, uh, just in terms of fuel, uh, you know, food, water, all of that kind of stuff. And so delaying disembarkation from, again, uh, you know, it's, it's it's actually the I think the least important of the con concerns, but uh, for the kind of broader, um, yeah, in the broader situation, yeah, it is I suppose Im Im important. Um, 
because it, and this is it it's, it's about slowly bleeding these organizations uh, of the resources of the time um you know frustrating and hampering that that kind of action so thank you what, what did you pick go ahead thank you um so we're running out of time and i have a quick last question which is a small question but i've always been interested since i first saw you present this to my class and the SAR authority map, you showed that there are these two zones with overlapping jurisdiction between Malta and Italy. Yeah. So why has there not been some kind of arrangement to give exclusive authority to one coastal state in those two areas? Yeah, so, and this I think is really, um, I think that this has become more and more contentious as time has, time has progressed with this, because oftentimes what will happen is you have these sort of battling narratives around who is responsible for, for what. And so we have these like small little overlapping points of contention. Um, and I, again, I think like, I, I don't wanna suggest that, that everything that happens in the Med is as a result of inaction. But I think that there is a particular value to inaction on some of these things, like having, having ambiguity and uh, it, especially in like that sort of spatial context, is important because then it, yeah, I mean, it does allow for people to defer responsibility. This is not, you know, this happened in, in uh, Italian waters. Um, now, you know, the Maltese state can, or the Maltese can say we're not responsible for, for any of what is going on. Um, you know, oftentimes what will happen is there will be, be like, oh, well, you transited through Maltese waters. So this is now, you know, Maltese um, uh, responsibility. And so, uh, but yeah, in these, uh, again, I think that, that they're, um, you know, governments and bureaucracies uh, uh, and are uh, not, not always necessarily uh, effective in what they do. And I think that's that's you know, well known. But I think that that you know that's not just about incompetence. I think that that's actually like there's there's a, it, it it's intentional. I'm not saying that those those two little spots are necessarily intentional, but I think that it also what I'm saying is that there's not necessarily like, uh, uh, any pressure to address that because. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I think uh, the clearer the lines are, um, not necessarily in a borderline way, uh, the, the clearer that the demarcation um, in a lot of these issues uh, gets. I think that um, you know it it just slowly chips away at at state claims to the actions that they're taking, and and um, undermines uh, yeah undermines in, in the process. So. Um, yep. All right. Well, thanks very much for, for sharing. With yes, thank you. Thank you. All right. That's a wrap. We'll see you all on uh, May 19th.